Welcome to Holocaust Museum Houston's virtual programs. Thank you for taking time out and being here this evening. I'm Tamara Savage, Managing Director and Director of Public Programs, and it is my great pleasure to welcome Sandy Lessig here this evening. I want to mention two things before we proceed. We will leave time for a brief Q&A at the conclusion of Sandy's talk. To participate, please submit your questions through the Q&A box, which can be found at the bottom of the screen. We will do our best to get to as many of the questions as possible. This program is being recorded and will be available through our YouTube platform at a later date. We'll be sending out this information via email to all registrants within the next day or two. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Sandy. Sandy originates from Indianapolis and has lived in Hong Kong and Singapore. In Singapore, she started the country's first progressive Jewish congregation. Sandy moved to Houston 25 years ago with her husband and two children. She worked in development for the Jewish Federation of Greater Houston for over 18 years for, before retiring in 2018. Um, she is presently, um, she has also served on several boards, including Holocaust Museum Houston. She is presently a board of advisors trustee a member of the program committee and a docent at the museum. She currently serves as a, as a member of the Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, where she chairs the, the Strategic Planning Subcommittee. Sandy is also on the board of the World Federation of Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust and Descendants and co-chaired their 2015 conference in Houston. Sandy is a second gen whose father was a Holocaust survivor from Breisach, Germany. Through Their Eyes is a project that Sandy has been very instrumental in creating. This, product, this project teaches and encourages the second generation to continue telling the survivor stories of, to, of their parents so that this vital part of history is not forgotten. And now Sandy will tell you her father's story. Thanks very much. Um, I wish my dad could be here himself to tell you a story, but he died 21 years ago. So dad and I will tell it together. The first time I learned what happened to my father and his family was when I was in my early 20s, backpacking through Europe. I wanted to visit Breisach, the town my father is from in Germany. And dad suggested I write an old friend of his, Paul Brown, who invited me to stay with him. With his sons translating for him, he told me through his tears how his best friend Walter and his family were so badly treated when they were kids. I was shocked. Every time I had ever asked my, any questions of my Oma, which is German for grandma, like, who is that in the photo? She'd choke and start to cry, unable to answer like that. I learned not to ask any questions of this dear woman who meant the world to me. If I asked my dad, he only shared good memories of his childhood. And I graduated from high school in 1968. So besides the diary of Anne Frank, nothing was formally taught in school about the Holocaust. Now, my father, absolutely to his death, never really considered himself a Holocaust survivor because he got out while so many, including those he loved, didn't. When I returned from Europe on that trip, I asked him why he never told me his story, any, anything about any of that period. And he said, well, you know, it's one thing to survive battles driving a tank during the war, but to learn you've also survived unspeakable horrors made it impossible for me to talk about it to anyone. So don't ever ask me about that time again. And if my brother and sister are on, they'll know that he went schlutz. One of the things I think that made the, the growth of Hitler possible was the fact that economically Germany was in bad shape. The individual uh, had a very hard time to make a decent living. 
And uh, the big theme that the Nazis had was that uh, it's primarily due to the Jews that uh, uh, the economy was so bad. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's the old thing that if you say something often enough, then uh, pretty soon uh, you start uh, believing it. And uh, Jews were blamed for everything from soup to nuts. At that point, uh, I don't believe it was uh, forbidden to go to school, but it became really impossible to attend school in Breisach because uh, nobody would talk with you, sit with you. And worse than that, uh, I, I would risk getting beaten up by some more bigger Nazi bullies, you know, which happened uh, uh, any number of times. It became evident that uh, this whole process would accelerate over time. And even as early as uh, the early 1930s, my uh, mother started to feel that there would be no future for, for us, particularly for the children in uh, Germany. And she started to, uh, to uh, put out feelers to see if there was uh, a way to, to leave the country. Even though my dad at that point was adamantly opposed to, to it. He was born there, he's lived there, he's business there. He's, he, he just could not foresee a situation where uh, he, being a war veteran, a German citizen, having lived, uh, forefathers having lived there for hundreds of years, that he would have to leave this, this, this life. Uh, this was before the thought was given uh, that the Jews would be annihilated. It was really down the road. But the, the signs were there, the handwriting was on the wall that uh, no good could come of this. I think what was going on was pretty much the same uh, everywhere. I think that in small towns there were a lot of personal relationships more so than in large cities probably took a little longer for, for uh, everyone to realize the seriousness uh, of it. This was at a time when uh, Germany was putting its best foot forward during the Olympics because uh, there were so many foreigners there. They wanted to make a good impression. They did this by uh, toning down all the anti-Semitism. The papers didn't uh, feature anti-Semitic articles, which they did on a daily basis before then, and again afterwards, even more so. Uh, a lot of the slogans that were all over the city were removed, anti-Semitic slogans. Although the Nazi flag was out, there was no, no question about that, I mean, in profusion. But uh, the anti-Semitic aspects were toned down to such a degree that it was unbelievable. And within a short time after Olympics were over, it not only went right back, it uh, intensified. Somewhere along the way, my parents had definitely decided we had to go. So the best thing to do was to learn a trade so you could earn a living. And I was apprenticed to a, a Jewish electrician in Karlsruhe, Germany. I worked for him for, um, I think, uh, over a year. I know there were letters. I know there, there were uh, exchanges. I know there were telegrams exchanged. And by the way, our sponsor, Morris Liebman, he was the owner of the uh, Rheingold Breweries, which I understand was a well-known brand at one time. And I understand he sponsored quite a few uh, relatives, distant relatives in many cases. And he is the one that uh, provided the affidavit. He met us at the uh, dock in, uh, in uh, New York. And as a matter of fact, we got to New York uh, I remember, I could ask questions, I really could. I didn't understand the answers. <laughs> <But> <laughs> because uh, that was, uh, you know, 
spoke quickly and in a New York accent uh, was not what, uh, but I, uh, you know, I had a lot easier time than, than uh, the rest of them. My mother took in rumors uh, in the house that kind of helped to, uh, to uh, augment uh, the income. And then dad found a job uh, after uh, some months, I can't recall, working for a, a linen company called Dayons in Indianapolis. He worked in the uh, stock room, made $10 a week, and he, you know, he was in a new country. And I, I remember the, 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 the phrase used more than once, uh, mostly uttered by my mother. I would say, if we can get out and we just have bread with some salt on it. I felt that was. And I never questioned for a moment that this was my responsibility to keep uh, the family going, and I, I wouldn't spend five cents. Whatever money I got, it went directly to, to mom. She handled uh, the finances. And uh, little by little, we made it after the war. When I, uh, a friend and I drove to Breisach, one of the very first things I was interested in is uh, go to the cemetery and uh, because this is where my ancestors are all buried I found that almost all the graves were desecrated toppled the gravestones were toppled and uh, a lot of destruction you know wanton destruction this is a, uh, a sister of my mother's my aunt uh, Shanet and her husband and uh, four children that lived uh, in a uh, little town called Fellheim near Memmingen. It's, uh, it's in the Allgäu, which is a part of Bavaria. We tried desperately to get them out due to various reasons, primarily uh, economic. We could not get them out, and unfortunately, uh, they all perished. Having lived there, I do know that all Germans weren't Nazis. All Germans weren't uh, killer or delighted in doing what they did to the Jews. But the ones that were strong enough or didn't have, have enough intestinal fortitude, so to speak, to say anything because it would jeopardize their, their way of life. I think that uh, the idea that this, this uh, thing similar to Hitler can't occur somewhere else is uh, is false. I think it can it can occur somewhere else, including here. You know, for years I couldn't talk about any of this. I think just the fact that I'm older, and then uh, the fact that uh, if I don't talk about it, uh, how will how will anyone anyone know? I mean, it's, I think it's something that's that should be told. Lest we forget, I think is the word. Um, now I'd like to be able to show you some photos that were taken since that I that I've discovered since um, this film was made. This was actually I think recorded in. Um, the, the DVD was made in 2008, but dad recorded this just a couple years before when um, I think he, you know, he was, he had been diagnosed with cancer and uh, he finally started sharing his story in a more forthright way. So this is a view of Bryce Sock I thought you might like to see. It's very picturesque. It's wine producing country. Most little towns in Germany are either Lutheran or Catholic, and my father's town was Catholic. You might wonder even how people could tell someone was Jewish. And that was always recorded in the town records. When you were born, you were asked the religion. So even though my children were born in Hong Kong, we were asked their religion when we registered their births there too. So this is a procession that took place uh, honoring St. Stephen, and I'll explain more about that later. This is the old synagogue, which of course was burned um, on Kristallnacht, 
November 9th and 10th, uh, the night of, um, really it was called, it's referred to now as the November pogrom, when synagogues and Jewish institutions all over Germany were uh, burned. And this is my father and his grandfather in front of that synagogue. This is where, uh, that's a little plaza memorial to the Jews of Breisach where the synagogue stood. Now, when we were there last, with, I was there with my brother and sister, my brother's wife, one of his kids and my kids, my husband, and they were dedicating a little plaza here uh, in, in memory of the Jews. This house is called the Blue House or the Yiddishe Gemeinde House. And at the time uh, my dad was growing up, there was a, the community was too small to afford a rabbi, but they had a cantor. He lived in the top floor with his family and the bottom floor was a community house. And there are a group of righteous uh, non-Jews in Breisach who have worked to restore the history of the Jewish community there. Here's my brother, uh, Lee, and my sister, Ellen, and, um, and me, and we are, my sister-in-law uh, over in the corner, and we are signing a guest book because we're um, the last Breisachers to visit Breisach. In this blue house, they have created family trees of our families. So that's really something. And uh, the high school now has a course on um, a class that can be taken on the history of the Jews of Breisach. Now this woman who started this group is a psychiatrist and she had asked around town, whatever happened to the Jews in this town? She is of course not Jewish herself. And she was told in the, in the uh, city archives that there were no Jews that lived in Breisach and she just didn't believe it. She was like a dog with a bone. And she figured out a lot of the history and um, has seen that a lot of that has been restored. This is a plaque that she's pointing to about the Jews of Breisach. This is a famous, um, I, I don't wanna say, it, it's really a cathedral in Breisach called St. Stephen's that is quite famous, even in Germany. And the reason why it's named for St. Stephen and in memory of St. Stephen's is that you can see, um, if you will look just right of the middle and the bottom, you see a man with a pointed hat. I don't think many people um, I realize that all through um, the ages, Jews were meant off and on to distinguish themselves from non-Jews sometimes by wearing two different shoes. Uh, in this era of the Middle Ages, Jews were required to wear a pointed hat. So you can see that this man has a pointed hat. He has a rock in his hand and they are stoning St. Stephen because he was made a martyr, supposedly because Jews stoned him to death. Uh, Jews moved to Breisach from the 1100s. We have a history of them living there. So, um, you know, they, they go back for a long way in Breisach. And this is a sign that's in Breisach today, another memorial. I think it's also just interesting that there was a Catholic theologian in the town who moved to Breisach in 1935 and, and spoke out against Hitler. And he was arrested for that criticism and died in a concentration camp. It was not easy to stand up for Jews. This is a photo of my, my father and his little sister, Helga. What's interesting about this photo is that at the time I was at the Holocaust Museum in Berlin, there was a video in one of the rooms that's running of children at a party where everybody dressed up in the small town of Breisach, Germany. And there I see, I see a couple of children dressed like this. And I realized it was my father and his sister in this film. Um, they called the director of the museum. He came, he couldn't believe it. And that was just interesting. These are more photos of family members that perished. Although this was my aunt Rosa who did not uh, die. She um, and her second husband made it to Shanghai where they survived. This is my father and his sister and my grandparents. 
at just about the time they left Germany. Streets of Breisach. And I have this photo of my two kids and my sister and me, because for those of you who know me from Indianapolis, most people don't have names as long as Bry Soccer. And when we saw the sign in Colmar, France, indicating the way to the, the, one of the main streets is Bry Soccer Strasse, everybody went nuts. So um, one of the questions was from um, Veronica Whitaker. She was wondering if your father ever reconnected with anyone in the town and also what was his most important lesson he shared with you from his experience? Um, first of all, I think that um, my father did reconnect with Paul. The other friend who came to his bar mitzvah died in World War II, fighting for the Nazis, of course. and. Um, he did reconnect with Paul. He went back finally to Germany and they visited Paul and his wife. And um, I am still in touch with one of Paul's sons. And uh, we all had dinner together the last time we were in Breisach. Um, we stay in touch all the time, so by email. So I think both men would be happy to know that their, their kids are in touch and are friends. I think the lessons that we got from my father were many and my grandparents. One was uh, that my, um, you take care of your neighbor, that if something can happen to Jews, it can happen to anybody. I think we were raised with a certain amount of fear. Um, I think my brother and sister and I probably each had different, um, yeah, different experiences and would have different feedback. I see, see my sister sharing other people we've been in touch with. My aunt Helga's been in touch with friends and neighbors. Um, there was a very strong work ethic, as in you never know, you never know. Work and save your money. If you don't have enough money saved, you don't buy it. So um, my parents always lived as if we were poorer than we were because I think there was a certain amount of fear that was unspoken. Nobody really knew. But when I've talked to my cousin Wendy about it, um, she's kind of reported the same thing. So I don't know. Um, so um, somebody also asked that, uh, his name's Jeff Paul, and he said he never felt good about going to Germany. What was your reason to go back? Well, Initially, I went back because I just wanted to see where my dad is from. And as you may have heard me share, um, this is before you studied the Holocaust in school. So, you know, I'm 71. In the 60s, they weren't doing that. And uh, in 50s, they, they just weren't doing that. And so um, I didn't really know my family. You know, I just was detached from it. I, I didn't know much. So it's really Paul who told me more about my, my family's experience. Um, however, I've gone back again and again because of this righteous group of Gentiles that live there that have tried to restore the history and have really reached out to those. I also have to say that Germany owns its past. Not all European countries do. We know Poland has a lot of trouble with that. We know other countries, Hungary, we were just in Hungary where my mother's grandmother perished in Auschwitz. And we were there just a year ago and Hungary suppresses their role in it. So I really respect Germany. They have a relationship with Israel. Um, Holocaust studies are, are mandatory in schools to one degree or another, just they are just so that some of them are in the United States now depending on the state you're from. So I actually credit Germany for um, its ownership of its role. Um, and another question, your dad said he finally talked about it because he was getting old and thought the story should be told. But was there a spark, an author or an event, a push by you or others in the family? Well, dad knew that I was giving tours at the museum. And he, the first time he entered the museum, he really, 
he heard the Hitler, the song of the Hitler Youth was playing behind one of the um, displays and he had to leave. It just made him sick to his stomach. But on another visit to Houston, he did come with me. He asked not to be identified as, as a survivor and he went along with the students and he could see the impact it had on them. Then years later, he had already given his testimony to the Shoah Foundation, but I didn't find it was very forthcoming about some of what the pain that he'd been through. So I got him to do it here at the museum. And by then he'd also been diagnosed with cancer. And I don't know that he necessarily knew it was fatal at that point, but I think he was just, he could see the value. I kept explaining to him, dad, you weren't in a concentration camp. You didn't suffer in that way, but you have a piece of that puzzle. It's before the war. And most people just start learning about this period of history in 1939, when Germany invades Poland and the war begins. And the horror doesn't begin of the systematic murder of Jews until after that. So, you know, I really wanted him to see that he had a role in, in, in talking about what happened before. Mm -hmm. Well, he did a great job. Um, are there any stumbling stones in Breisach? Um, I've been asked that before. And, you know, it's funny, there are stumbling stones all over um, Austria, in, in all kinds of countries now, mm -hmm. well, Germany for certain. But this town has resisted it. Um, I understand there's some politics behind it, but instead they've put all kinds of memorials around where the Jews were deported. Um, the, the Blue House, the Yudisha Gemeinde House, the Memorial Plaza. And I think they feel that that has been, they don't need to do the, the Stumblestein or would, the Stumblestones um, themselves. Where was your father when he did the video? Well, they lived in California. My father, uh, they retired from Indianapolis to California. So he was living out there. Um, yeah, so, but they would visit us in Houston. No, but just when he did, was the video Rice done? University did all the videos for oh. Holocaust Museum Houston. Okay. So um, you can visit our website to see some videos and other videos, including my dad's original one with the Shoah Foundation. If you go to the USC Shoah Foundation website, you can click on anyone's video. You can do it by subject. You can do it by year. You can do it by camp. So um, that's available to anyone doing research. And Holocaust Museum Houston, for a very minimal amount of money, you can join and put in a pitch there. And you will see all <laughs> kinds of programming that's going on all the time that features our survivors. And uh, that might be interesting to you. Um, so here's an interesting question. What is your opinion of Holocaust education in the US and is there enough of it? And is there any standard for it? No, there's no national standard because education is handled in a state, state by state basis. I think there are about 19 states that um, mandate Holocaust education, but they do not have curriculum that says this is what you should teach or this is how much you have to teach. So what's here in Texas, I serve on that commission and we're doing everything we can with our own website, with reaching out to educators throughout Texas um, to encourage uh, teachers, to encourage geography and social studies teachers, literature-based teachers. Um, and this is being done in some other states to one degree or another. It's definitely more successful in states where there are major museums, Illinois, um, Los Angeles, California. It doesn't mean it's always mandated, but there's a lot of curriculum materials available for educators and ongoing education for educators throughout the US. And you don't have to live in Texas to access that for our museum or um, for the Cleveland Museum, or you know, any of these larger museums, the Museum of Jewish Heritage in uh, New York, or the US 
um, Memorial Holocaust Museum, Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC. There's so much available. Is there enough done? No. So it takes all of us to put pres pressure on our legislators to pass that kind of legislation. Um, we've done that in Texas. And as I said, I, our museum was very instrumental in having that happen. I think 11 or 12 years ago it was founded. Um, so one of the questions was uh, about your mother. Was she a Holocaust survivor? No, my mother's uh, family, there was a lot of anti-Semitism in, in uh, Hungary. Um, her mother's family was from a small town called Sharvar, which is also happens to be where, um, anyway, one of our other survivors is from there, Alice Kahana. And I visited that small town a year ago. Um, and in the, I think late 19, 1900s, my, my um, mother's father worked to get them out. His brother went to Israel, and I think they got to the United States around 1920. I think if one of my cousins is on, they might have that at their fingertips more than I. And my mother was the youngest of uh, five kids. So she was the only one of her siblings who was actually born in the United States. Um, it wasn't just until a very few years ago that I learned that, of course, they left their parents behind and that my um, maternal great-grandmother perished in Auschwitz. I'm just trying to assemble some of that history myself. So um, another question, your dad said, never forget. Do you believe your son and daughter will follow your example and keep the story alive? I do, I do. I think they're cognizant of what I do. I think, I think they're proud of it. Um, I think they're both um, activists in their own way, um, the way each of them can be. And um, they both have been involved to one degree or another with the museum here. And uh, I know my daughter's connected with some third generation sites. And incidentally, on Facebook, there are sites for second generation, third generation, it's all there. So you just have to do some searching. And if you need some help, you can always contact me and I'll try to put you in touch with other organizations and sites. Besides, when I'm gone, they can tell my father's story. They knew him. Have you heard of the curriculum facing history and ourselves? Of course, a fine curriculum. Yes. Okay, it looks like I've answered all the questions. I just also want to mention, um, Sandy, that somebody called Jerry Halal, Halas? My, my first cousin. Right, and wanted to know, he, she, he wanted you, is it a she or he? He, Jerry. He wants you to know that you that he is um, watching you on this <laughs> web. Hi, Jerry, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen some of those cousins in many years because we just live so far away from each other. Um, I think you I have a lot of wanted... fans on here, Sandy. <laughs> oh, thank you. I wanted to say also that um, we have five other of these that we have produced, mm -hmm. and we're only limited by money because I think that we want to, as much as possible, when our survivors are able to speak, I don't go out to schools. It's only when we don't have a survivor available, and very sadly, we're losing our survivors. And um, I just don't wanna see their, some of their testimonies are two or three hours long. And this is a way for them, for people to see an edited version. All right. And um, do you wanna talk a little bit, because we have a little bit of time about, okay. about um, what you do with this, this uh, through their eyes and how you are spreading the word and helping other organizations? Um, thank you, Tamara. Yeah, I was asked to present this to the um, the AHO, which is an international organization of Holocaust um, organizations, and um, and then through that, the World Federation of um, Jewish Child Survivors of the Holocaust and Descendants, and then because of that, people in other 
countries and in other cities asked me, how did I create this? And um, of course it took some money. <laughs> you saw that we had some funding. Um, and we, um, so I've helped, uh, let's see, Calgary, which included Vancouver, um, a couple places in Florida, and then other places that write me um, and say, "May can you share, can you help us do this? And um, when that happens, I, we, I, uh, together with the director of education at the museum, I don't do this as an unguided missile. Um, I do it with staff support at the museum and um, because I'm not a scholar. And um, we've created a how-to book, booklet, that uh, makes suggestions on how you can do this in your own community. Um, I'm sure since we created this, boy, this video was made in 2008. So we went for the, the funding even before that. So I think since then we probably could do it more easily with current editing techniques that I'm not aware of. But I think that there's a way for uh, second and third generation to use their parents' videos and create this as we have in Houston. Yeah, I mean, you've done a fabulous job with that. And then you're starting to get more of the other pe people that in Houston involved in doing this. Um, you recently met with um, our visitor and volunteer services yeah. to try and So do that. right now when uh, we don't have students visiting, usually they're visiting the museum as classes and I'm giving tours. Um, or people that can't visit, schools that can't visit the museum, maybe don't have the funding um, or time, I would go out to the school or company or institute, whatever institution, civic organization to present, as do some of the others who created these. And um, now we want to make them available so that I'll be presenting just as the way I did to you, to students from sixth grade on, middle school through high school, as requested as part of our program, because right now students across, really, I think across the spectrum can request a virtual tour of yes. the museum, mm -hmm. as well as requesting through their eyes if they wanted to hear this. So, um, and, and if a, a second generation member isn't available, maybe a close friend could do this. So we're, we're just trying to explore how we can carry on um, after there aren't survivors to tell their stories. And that's really important. And that's a very, very important. I think that it's, you know, you've done a wonderful job in, in putting this together and showing how it can be done because I think people always worried about how you could get that sort of eyewitness account mm -hmm. from the second generation. And I think this worked really extremely well by editing you know the video and you adding your own personal touch i think it makes it very very sort of warming and emotional thank you you, you get that feeling you know of what the relationship you had with your father so, yeah it always um i always have to keep myself some of the time especially when i know he teared up during the during the taping and we would have to stop so that he could shed his tears and and we could resume. In those moments, which I recall, sometimes it's hard for me not to cry myself. Yeah. That's really great, you know. By the way, I've got more family members. Phil is there, and so is your sister. So, uh, and um, they're all saying hi. <laughs> Thank you. So Sandy, um, as I said, you know, it's so important for the second gen to continue to tell their parents' story and you're setting a wonderful example. And so I really want to thank you. Is there anything else you want to say before we sign out? Now, if anybody wants to know more about this, um, please feel free to contact um, T Savage at hmh.org and she will always put you in touch with me. I'm not gonna give my personal email here, but tomorrow knows how to reach me anytime. I certainly do. <laughs> so thank you everyone. Thank you, Sandy. I, I wanna be considered of everyone's time. So we'll close out this program. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and good night. <laughs>